All right, so, um, hi, my name is Jamisha Fisher, and my talk is on securing the heart of automated infrastructure. So just a little bit about me, there's my Twitter handle. Um, I'm a DevOps security pirate at Cloud Passage. Um, I chose that title because titles lulls. Um, <laughs> I, uh, the work that I do is primarily in ops, but I also work a lot with our security team. Um, and we also, as you know, as being a security company and being a part of a team that does ops as well as cares a lot about security, you know, we have it in a lot of our automation efforts. Um, so what I'm here to discuss today is why security is DevOps, as well as talk about um, how uh, the deployment process of Chef, as well as a little bit of Puppet, because I did um, talk with some Puppet people in the past couple of weeks. Um, Bill Weiss, if you're seeing this on the live stream, thank you so much. Um, so I hope to talk about um, how those security principles relate to both of those when trying to uh, do a deployment. Well, specifically planning and testing. So why is security DevOps? Well, for one thing, it's in the public eye more than ever. You have brand name vulnerabilities such as Heartbleed, which everybody got hit by. And apparently there's still, um, I read an uh, article today where there's apparently 200,000 machines that are still vulnerable to it you know, to this day. Um, you also have shell shock, which everybody with, everybody with a Unix-based machine basically got hit by. So now those are in the public eye more than ever thanks to social media and, and everything that's coming out in the internet age. You also have breaches of various industries, some of them very, very mainstream. Everybody remembers the, um, the Sony hack that recently, uh, that occurred sometime uh, last year. Uh, even, you know, security professionals were asking actors, hey, what is your opinion on this? So it's like now becoming more in the forefront for even people that you wouldn't even think about it, having it. Um, as well as digital fraud and crimes. I mean, earlier in the year, there was an Aetna insurance breach, breach and then weeks after that, you had, um, TurboTax all of a sudden getting fraudulent um, tax claims, or um, the recently in the news with Ashley Madison breach and how that affected more people than it should, including in, in negative and very negative ways. I mean, people in the Middle East were suddenly having to figure out, hey, I should probably get a visa somewhere because they might find out the information that I'm gay. Like, that, it's in the public eye more than ever and it's affecting people more than ever. So with that in mind, it's even more important that we secure our systems and provide for, the, for our customers and clients. Another thing, security principles match up with the DevOps pretty darn well. To give you an example, we have the security triad of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So first, starting off with availability. Um, and these definitions I'm taking from uh, a NIST specialized, specialization doc, um, NIST being the National Institute of uh, Standards and Technology. Um, so availability is for any system to serve its purpose. The information must be available when it's needed. So what does that mean from a DevOps perspective? Is that A, has to be fast, and B, we have to ensure uptime. And what uptime might mean is different for different parts of the company. I mean, um, for ops, it might mean uptime that doesn't impact the customer. Um, and that might be the same thing for sales. As long as it's not impacting the customer, it's fine. Or it's ensuring uptime so that, you know, you don't get paged at 3 a.m. in the morning. Um, integrity that a system and its data are not manipulated for unauthorized functionality or alteration. So in my mind, it means, excuse me, let me take a breath. In my mind, it means that things should be repeatable and standardized. 
So that can either be accomplished by through the use of automation tools or, or um, other tools that we have in our arsenal. Like it's not necessarily gonna be Puppet or Chef, it may be something else or something along with Puppet and Chef in order to make it happen like Jenkins. But when we do have it repeatable and standardized, we're able to have it, one, be auditable, and be processed in such a way that if there is an issue that comes up, we can monitor it and detect it, like, like what's been talked about in previous talks. The final thing is confidentiality, which is the requirement that private or confidential information not be disclosed to unauthorized individuals. And this is where, in my mind, DevOps really shines. Because in order for that to happen, especially with security, you have to be collaborative. So you can be limiting. There, there are gonna be times when by policy, some people can't see what you can see, but that's when um, that's when knowledge sharing comes in or um, telling them why they can't see it or trying to find true solutions without having the access necessarily. So it's controlled, but not siloed. So why is this important for the deployment of our automation services? Well, with Chef and with Chef and all these tools being so central to what we're doing and what we're automating, um, it's we have to make sure that. Gosh, let me rewind. Okay, so oh, brain. Um, with automation services, there are so many people using them in the world of DevOps. So because of that, we have to make sure that all the needs are being met from beginning to end and they're met, being met securely. So it's important that from start to finish, especially when we're deploying a new tool, that security is involved. <laughs> all right, so I have a good time here. Um, so let's go into planning. Availability. All right. So you have the usual things when you're planning for availability. How many nodes do you plan to have? Are you gonna do uh, cloud or bare metal or both? Uh, what do you plan to do with the automation services once you have them up? And the final one that people just gloss over is, how quickly do we need to recover? That should be the most important thing you should think about. In fact, that is probably the, one of the things that security thinks about the most because there is going to be a time where you're either going to be hit or something's gonna happen, like a rack space reboot that happens with less than 24 hours notice. You know, like you have to think about these things. How are you gonna recover? So when you're thinking about deploying a tool, you have to assess that risk. Um, I wish I could bring up the definition of risk, but I have forgotten. Look it up yourselves. Um, but when you consider that, you consider the risk of, okay, how much uptime can we, can we be without in order to get this back up? And from there, you also wrap in the other stuff. So for us, our company is, yes, we do need Chef, but we could go without it for a bit to set it back up. Now, that might be different for different companies. We also have different needs. So, for example, um, on HA requirements, some people are like, we need HA everywhere, across different places and different things. Um, and that might not be feasible. Um, and that might not be feasible if you're, for instance, like my company, we're a multi-cloud environment. So, though we want HA to happen, it's only limited to AWS for Chef so we can't necessarily use it. Whereas on the other hand, you know, if you're a Puppet user, you do have the ability to stretch out and have HA, but at the same time, you also have a limitation with the certificate authority. So these are things you kind of have to take in consideration when assessing the risk and what you want to deploy with. So once you have that figured out, and whether you want to do and how you want it to be structured and, 
and what risk you're willing to take on rebuilding. You then think about planning with integrity. So how do you configure the servers? How are they gonna be configured? Where the, well, the, the lazy answer is, <laughs> um, is to automate. Um, but at the same time, sometimes that may not be the answer for you. Sometimes it's like, no, we're really only just gonna throw this up once. So it may be that you may not wanna automate. You may wanna do it manually. Chef really has made it easy for you to do it manually. In fact, I did it last night in order to set up this short demo. Um, um, and then after that, it's how do you ensure uh, security, standards and security? And there's other ways to do that too. You can do it through automation and through Chef recipes as well as um, the auditing capability in Chef and some of the mini modules in Puppet. Um, in addition to that, you can also have some redundancy um, with uh, software vulnerability assessment tools as well as uh, configuration security monitoring, which is both provided by ThreatStack and by my company and by many others. Um, it's an additional check to have outside of your system just for good redundancy. Um, one thing security people like, we like having multiple ways to, to check if everything, goes, everything is okay because you always run into a false positive. So the final planning is on confidentiality. How do you wanna structure your services? Um, and when I mean, do you want to do it by org base? So like, let's say you're a software as a services company like Chef. Do you want to structure your services with different organizations? Which at the same time provides a whole lot of finite control with security, which we love. Causes a whole lot of overhead at the same time because it's like then how do you manage, you know, all the modules? Where do they go? How do you upload them? How do you make sure that everything stays consistent? Or do you want to kind of go org less and have everything in one pot? Um, which can be easier, but also has its own ups and downs. So that's something that, you know, it's up to your team and how you want to roll it. Um, and then how are we going to deploy? Are we going to go straight from scratch? Are we doing an upgrade or a migration, which was the case with my team of how we are upgrading from Chef Open Source 10 to Chef Enterprise 12. <laughs> um, that kind of factors in with the confidentiality too as far as access and how you're gonna move stuff. And then also how are, how are users going to access? And one second, please. Um, and how are users going to access? Um, my brain is completely blanking. Yay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Been there, done that. Have a t shirt. Um, okay. So there we go. All right. So basically, how are users gonna access? And there's two important questions in this. One, are you gonna integrate with LDAP? And both Chef and Puppet has ways to integrate with that um, for their council. Um, but you also wanna keep in mind, okay, when you're uploading code, how do you limit that access? Uh, for Chef, we had to use specifically move from uh, using client keys to access to actual users um, because we hit a really bad bug. <laughs> um, that's one tidbit for you chef folk trying to upgrade. Um, but otherwise, don't know where I was going with that, but we'll figure it out. Um, so now having all that in mind, we go into the testing phase, which I love, because this is where you see where everything breaks. <laughs> which is also the prep and pa practice of you know, firefight, of worst case scenarios. It can happen during testing. 
So when you're prep and practice for firefighting is for availability, you of course you build and set up the servers. This means the SSL certs and certificate authorities too if you're puppet if you're in puppet land. Um, you ensure the you ensure the minimum authorized users can log in because again you're trying to make sure that it's secure and something solid and not everybody can have access to it until it's ready. Um, from there, you test basic operations and just worst case scenarios. Um, this is also the opportune time to even um, practice doing a fire scenario where it's like, okay, everything just got obliterated and you have to recreate it from scratch or backups. Um, that's something that you also need to test, especially for security. They require that for auditing. Um, for integrity, you uh, check software vulnerability, software vulnerability management as well as um, configuration security monitoring for consistency. And this is both when you're setting up the server as well as post setup. Um, and even after that, I mean, um, as I'm gonna show you in a little bit, with the three minutes of time I have left, um, I'm gonna show you how that in in our software, it's pre and post setup, how you can check that and rescan over and over again for that continuous monitoring that was talked about in the previous talk. It's also verifying that firewall rules work, which I completely skipped in my last section, um, and making sure that you can uh, basically access everything as well as everything is uh, in a secure spot. Um, one tidbit to keep in mind for you chef users, loop back, you need to keep it open. Um, yeah, otherwise bad things, like bad things will happen. It's, it's sad that you have to keep loop back open, but it's, it, it, it like burned two weeks of my time. It was, it was fun. Um, so basically verifying that the firewall will, rules work and make things operable, as well as, you know, after that, making sure that the SSL is valid and set up. So from there, the confidentiality kind of rolls in. You create your organizational setup based off of what you decided, creating the users and role-based access, and then testing authentication and basic operations. Um, so before I jump into the conclusion part, I am just kind of gonna roll through this just to kind of show you some of the process. Um, Let's blow that up a bit bigger. Just from the chef's side, if I can make it a bit bigger. Can you guys see that from the back? Yeah. yeah. So basically, that's the basic um, tier configuration for a chef server. Um, one thing that they leave out is the SSL certificate configuration. So if anybody wants to grab that from me or talk with me about that later, feel free to. Um, and then, so that's, you know, the basic setup, but also you want to keep in mind, so for that server, it's, so here's the interface that we have, and here's the firewall rules that I'm checking. This is very, very minimal, and I'm not saying that it should be min uh, minimal. Um, it should be as detailed as you can possibly get it based off of the needs of your company, and it should also have more outbound rules than this because security stickler on outbound rules. Um, but there's also um, software vulnerability checks that I've made. This is one before updating. So we have a couple bind utils and uh, CVE references. And where's the other one? And then this is post, where now all I have is the dreaded kernel upgrade. Um, so this is part of like the SVM check as a part of the testing, and this is something you should continuously look at um, as you're monitoring. So, okay. So in conclusion, with availability, you should always plan for recovery and test setup and basic operations at bare minimum. You should be testing for more than that, but bare minimum. Um, integrity, you should plan for the repeatable and enforceable and should check for security always. And then for confidentiality, you should plan out user organization and that includes users and roles. And also test for operability, of course.
and that is it. Any questions?